Famously, after having won a battle against Rome, the general Pyrrhus of Epirus is said to have remarked, if we win one more victory against Rome, we shall be utterly ruined. That comment and his many battles against Rome at great cost to his own forces led to the term a Pyrrhic victory, a term that has become so associated with Pyrrhus that we seem to have forgotten virtually everything else that he did. But despite his eventual defeat in Italy against Rome, Pyrrhus had a long and broad military career across the Greek world. Hannibal, famous for his own victories against Rome, rated Pyrrhus among the greatest generals of his time. It is history that deserves to be remembered. Pyrrhus was born in 319 BC to the then prince of Epirus, Aesides, just four years after the death of his second cousin, Alexander the Great. Epirus, located largely in modern Albania on the Adriatic Sea, was, according to Greek legend, founded by the only son of Achilles. From him supposedly descended the kingship, all the way down to Pyrrhus. Pyrrhus's life was dominated by Alexander the Great's legacy and the fight between his successor over Alexander's empire. Fighting between powers was constant, alliances were fluid, and all the powers sought every opportunity to undermine the others. Most important to Pyrrhus was Antigonus, who ruled over much of modern Turkey and into modern Israel, and his son Demetrius. It was impossible to be a king in the period and not become involved, though Epirus was a minor player. Pyrrhus's father lost his crown attempting to support Alexander's mother in the fight over Macedon and was killed trying to retake it from the Macedonian king Cassander. Pyrrhus was raised in the court of an Illyrian king, who himself likely saw the advantages of an ally with a claim to Macedon. According to historical sources, the Illyrian king was convinced by the baby Pyrrhus himself, who either supplicated himself before the king or clung to the statue of a god, convincing the king it was the will of the gods that Pyrrhus be protected. When Pyrrhus was 11 or 12, the Illyrian king even fought a war to put Pyrrhus back on the throne, a rule that lasted only five years before he was dethroned while attending a wedding. Without a kingdom, Pyrrhus found work with Demetrius, a son of the successor Antigonus. Antigonus was reportedly impressed with Pyrrhus, and allegedly said that he would be the greatest general of his time if he lived long enough. Demetrius was married to Pyrrhus's sister, making them family, and Pyrrhus served with the Antigonoids at the Battle of Ipsus, the largest and one of the most important battles between the successor states. At Ipsus, Antigonus faced all of the other Deodaci. At the battle, Pyrrhus served with Demetrius in the position of honor on the right wing. While Pyrrhus distinguished himself, Demetrius's successful cavalry charge at the beginning of the battle turned into a disaster when a contingent of elephants, which had been left in reserve, blocked him from returning to aid his father. Antigonus was killed, and his kingdom split between the victors. Demetrius embarked on a quest to restore his father's territory, but Pyrrhus was sent to Egypt as a hostage in exchange for Ptolemy exiting the war. Ptolemy was also impressed with Pyrrhus, who he married to one of his daughters. It was Ptolemy who became his principal supporter when he returned to Epirus to regain his throne. Instead of fighting the king already in place, his cousin, Pyrrhus ruled the kingdom jointly until he got word that a plot was afoot to assassinate him. Pyrrhus struck first, killing his cousin. According to Plutarch, the chief men among the Epirites were devoted to Pyrrhus, despite the murder, and in fact were eager to see Pyrrhus rid himself of his cousin. He was finally and firmly back in place as king of the kingdom of his father. Ancient sources repeatedly say that he had a single great interest, war. Once, when asked who was a better flute player, he answered instead that one was a great general. Plutarch says that Pyrrhus was constantly studying and meditating upon military matters, and that other parts of his life he regarded as mere accomplishments and held them in no esteem. He was also especially well known for his haughtiness and was inclined to look down upon his inferiors. He was also bored by peace. He found it tedious to the point of nausea if he were not for inflicting mischief on others or suffering it at others' hands. Pyrrhus's army was trained in the Macedonian style, armed with long pikes and supported by significant cavalry forces. Cassander's death in 297, followed quickly by the death of his heir, led to a scramble for the kingdom. Pyrrhus fell out with his former brother-in-law, Demetrius, as they both attempted to seize the territory. In one battle, Pyrrhus fought the enemy general one-on-one. -on -one. His victory earned him the nickname Eagle. The rest of the Diodaci allied against Demetrius. Pyrrhus played the most important role in their multi-pronged attack, using his popularity in Macedon to convince much of Demetrius' army to desert en masse in favor of Pyrrhus as king. Despite his success, Pyrrhus' allies took their own share, forcing Pyrrhus to satisfy himself with half of Macedon and the Greek region of Thessaly. It would become a theme that Pyrrhus' conquests were quickly lost. Lysimachus, who ruled Thrace, seized Pyrrhus's half of Macedon, forcing him to withdraw to Epirus. 
That, too, would last only for a short time, as intrigue saw several rulers change place in quick succession. Instead of pressing his own claims, Pyrrhus turned his attention to Italy. Their Greek colonies had been battling Italians for years, but now they faced a greater power, Rome. At some point, Rome had signed a treaty with the Greek colony of Tarentum, not to enter their harbor, but during a drunken festival, several Roman ships had appeared, driven there by a storm. Tarentum immediately attacked and soon struck at Roman garrisons in nearby cities. Rome was already fighting on multiple fronts, but formed another army to fight Tarentum. Pyrrhus agreed to help the Tarentites, on the severe condition that he be allowed to garrison and thereby control Tarentum. With some concerns, they accepted. Pyrrhus landed in Italy with a force of around 25,000, including 20 war elephants gifted to him by Diodaci allies. The Romans had never before faced war elephants, which would be a terrifying threat. Horses often hated even approaching an elephant, nor had they faced the impressive Macedonian pike phalanx. In Italy, he would fight two important battles. First, the Romans rushed a four legions, more than 40,000 soldiers, to Heraclea. Sources agree that Pyrrhus was outnumbered, with around 35,000 soldiers. Pyrrhus set his men on one side of a river, forcing the Romans to cross. When they did, he attacked with his cavalry. At one point, he was nearly killed, so he exchanged some of his armor with the lieutenant, so he'd be less recognizable. Plutarch says the battle swung back and forth seven times and was nearly lost when the lieutenant wearing Pyrrhus's helmet was killed. He was forced to ride bareheaded among his men to rally them. Finally, the Roman commander moved cavalry to strike at the Greek flanks. Pyrrhus brought in his elephants, and the cavalry routed. With the Roman infantry exposed, the elephants turned to rout them in turn. Pyrrhus did not pursue, either because one of his elephants threatened to panic, or because, as Pyrrhus allegedly wrote, that one should never press relentlessly on the heels of an enemy in flight, to make him more inclined to withdraw another time, knowing the victor would not strive to destroy him in flight. The results of the battle are uncertain. One account says that the Romans lost 15,000 and the Greeks 13,000, while Plutarch reports 7 and 4,000, respectively. This first encounter with elephants led the Romans to call them Lucanian oxes, after the name of the region. Pyrrhus was faced with his first Pyrrhic victory, and to acknowledge the bravery of the Romans. The Romans blamed the defeat on poor generalship, saying that it was not the Epirotes who had conquered the Romans, but Pyrrhus who conquered the Roman general. This is the battle that won Pyrrhus his greatest renown. Nearby cities switched their allegiance to the Greeks. Pyrrhus sent a delegation seeking peace, if Rome wouldn't sign a treaty and guaranteed the Tarentines' freedom, as well as most of the rest of southern Italy. According to ancient sources, a blind senator exhorted the Romans not to surrender until Pyrrhus left Italy for good. The delegation, on the return to the Epirotes, were impressed with Rome, especially her ability to raise more troops. They were a hydra for them to fight against, since the consul already had twice as many soldiers collected as those who faced their enemies before, and the Romans had at least two other armies in the field at that time. Pyrrhus marched within two kilometers of Rome itself, but was forced to retreat as four Roman armies threatened to trap him. The following year, Pyrrhus marched more cautiously, threatening several Roman cities and drawing the Romans into another battle near the city of Asculum. The battle had several conflicting descriptions in ancient sources. Most sources say the battle lasted only one day, while Plutarch insists it took two. Ancient estimates say the armies were fairly evenly matched, with between forty and 70,000 soldiers apiece. To counter the elephants, the Romans constructed wagons with a swinging arm, pushed by oxen, with archers inside and spears on the front dipped in pits that could set, be set aflame. And they were miniature, movable fortresses. According to Plutarch, the first day was fought in difficult terrain, which made the pike phalanx ineffective and prevented the Greeks from bringing their elephants to bear. Overnight, Pyrrhus occupied the worst ground so that the Romans would be forced to fight on level ground. Other sources describe it differently. Cassius Dio says that the armies camped on each side of the river were nervous about engaging, but that finally Pyrrhus allowed the Romans to cross before engaging. Several accounts point out that again, Pyrrhus held his elephants in reserve and used them to counter Roman cavalry. The wagons seemed to have been at least somewhat effective, although they were vulnerable to attacks by light infantry. According to most sources, the Epirotes lost the battle when approaching Roman allies marched fortuitously into the Greek camp. Pyrrhus sent soldiers to intercept the enemy, but his soldiers panicked, believing the camp had fallen. Pyrrhus himself was wounded. Most accounts say Pyrrhus lost more men. Plutarch is alone in claiming the Romans lost. Casualties for the battle are also vary. Plutarch reported 6,000 Romans dead and 3,505 Greeks, while others say only 5,000 Romans were killed, but 20,000 Greeks. It is after this battle that Plutarch reports the famous Pyrrhic quotation, If we are victorious in one more battle with the Romans, we shall be utterly ruined. The battle forced Pyrrhus to accept that he could not defeat the Romans in battle, for the enemy, though defeated, were in no way humbled, since their dominion was so great, whereas the victor had suffered the damage and the disaster that goes with defeat. 
As historian Theodorus wrote, instead of fighting it out, Pyrrhus chose a new adventure, invading Sicily to fight the Carthaginians. Several Greek cities in Sicily gave him their allegiance in exchange for his generalship. Of course, Tarentum was upset, but Pyrrhus merely set a garrison and sailed for new shores. First he sailed to Syracuse, then under siege by the Carthaginians. He broke the naval blockade without a fight and forced the Carthaginians to abandon the siege. His campaign in Sicily is little documented, but he quickly advanced across the island. During one especially contested siege, he scaled the walls first himself, knocking defenders off of it and leaving the dead in heaps about him with strokes of his sword. His successes led him to be declared King of Sicily, as Polybius wrote. Pyrrhus was the only man whom all the Sicilians had accepted as their leader and king deliberately, out of affection. He captured the whole island with the exception of the port of Lilibayum, which was heavily fortified. Failing to take it, he forced the Greek cities to help him build a new fleet to invade Africa, which his Sicilian allies did not like, nor did they like that he abandoned the siege of Lilibayum. His popularity cratered, and he instituted purges until the cities threw him out. Plutarch writes that what he won by his exploits he lost by indulging, in vain hopes. He returned to Tarentum, but in the intervening years Rome had gained much. He was additionally out of money, and the war-torn Greek cities had little to give him. The Carthaginians sank what treasure they had secured in Sicily, and he even robbed, but returned money from a temple. He needed a significant victory and met the Romans at the city of Malaventum. At this battle, he outnumbered the Romans, but he made a series of mistakes. He attempted to ambush the Romans at night, but his men became lost and his attacking forces wiped out in the morning. His main army engaged the Romans later, and using his elephants, he seemed poised to win as the enemy routed. However, upon reaching the enemy camp, a young elephant was wounded. Crying for its mother, it panicked the other elephants, causing a rout which devastated his own forces. The Greeks were broken, and several elephants were captured. Some Roman sources say that the elephants were panicked instead by pigs that were lit on fire and sent into the Greek ranks. The battle was probably not decisive, however it forced Pyrrhus, low on funds, to return to Epirus. Pyrrhus left a force in Tarentum, intending to return, however within five years he was dead and the whole region was under Roman control. He needed money, and once again Macedonia was vulnerable, under the control of Antigonus, son of his former foe Demetrius. Again, he was quickly successful, capturing nearly the whole country while Antigonus fled to his fleet. But again, he was quickly distracted. Instead of securing his gains, he marched on Sparta at the invitation of a Spartan aristocrat. Pyrrhus took his army and invaded the Peloponnesus. The Spartans were well past their prime, and Pyrrhus destroyed their army, but was unable to take the city. Instead of pressing a siege, Pyrrhus again got word of an opportunity, this time north in the Argos, where two politicians vied for control. He marched on Argos under a constant attack from the Spartans. Pyrrhus' own son was killed in the fighting. In his rage, Pyrrhus was said to be invincible as he destroyed the force responsible. In Argos, he found Antigonus already waiting on good ground. Argos asked the forces to withdraw. The Macedonian force did, but Epirus instead ambushed the city in the night, encouraged by fifth column supporters in the city itself. He was able to enter the city, but the dark was too great an obstacle, and fighting had to be postponed. In the morning, Pyrrhus faced larger-than-expected resistance and the return of the Macedonian army. Pyrrhus decided to withdraw. He sent orders to tear down part of the wall to give him space to retreat. However, the order was misheard, and reinforcements instead attempted to enter the city as Pyrrhus attempted to withdraw. An elephant became trapped in the gate, and other elephants panicked, causing many casualties. Pyrrhus' force was trapped as the Argives descended. Pyrrhus gave his distinctive helmet to a lieutenant and turned to fight. A young Argive soldier threw a spear, which pierced his armor, and in his rage Pyrrhus turned on the boy. In despair, his mother chucked a ceiling tile, which hit Pyrrhus in the neck. He fell from his horse, either dead or unconscious. Finding him defenseless, an enemy soldier messily decapitated the king. And so ended the exploits of a great general, who despite winning many battles, always seemed to lack the patience to consolidate his gains. Still, he was the only Greek general who was able to check, even for a brief time, the ambitions of Rome, and thus his reputation grew as Rome's power grew. Ancient sources say that Hannibal thought him a great general, second only to Alexander himself, and say that his writings on war were highly influential, even though none of those writings have survived to today. They are lost to history making it an interesting irony that a general so successful is remembered almost uniquely for the term Pyrrhic victory, meaning a victory won at too great a cost.
I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy. Check out our community on thehistoryguyguild.locals.com, our webpage at thehistoryguy.com, and our merchandise at teespring.com, or book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo. And if you'd like more episodes on Forgotten History, all you have to do is subscribe.